Excellent. I'm Catherine Lambrecht. I am wearing two hats today. One is, uh, I'm the, uh, what do you call it, program chair or whatever I am with the Highland Park Historical Society. And I'm also with Greater Midwest Foodways and Culinary Historians of Chicago and Chicago Foodways Roundtable. But you know, it's like that big group that I'm just always doing something with. Um, our, um, this is our first effort in doing a virtual program. I'm very glad that um, our speaker today, uh, Sam, agreed to do this because uh, I had a few people did say, not, not now. Some people <laughs> want the feedback from people, and I get that. I get that. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's he's willing and able, and we're delighted. And he, uh, but I just want to point out, we will be having additional programming virtually. It's not, it's all, you know, in flux at the moment, but we will have additional programs going on with culinary historians. Uh, Highland Park Historical Society, we're going to be putting out a survey for people to kind of write their recollections of things that are happening right now. Because all these things that we're doing while we're staying home are things that a year from now, we're not going to totally remember. And it's the here and the now that I'm trying to capture. Um, and for those people in Highland Park, we're considering that they'll embargo, that information will be embargoed for about 10 years. So you could say what you want and not have to worry about offending anybody. Uh, and certainly there's been some interesting uh, chatter, I mean, with Nancy Rotary, our mayor, asking people to stay home and then says, okay, you kids that were hanging out on this street, we've taken your picture. All right, we saw you talking too close. And can you believe this? Somebody who was testing positive went to the grocery store. Yeah. Hmm. And she knew about it. So apparently, you know, uh, everybody's out telling each other about these things. It didn't say, oh, no, I talked to somebody else in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, that's my speaker tomorrow for Mushroom Club. Somebody was walking his dog and said, please, steer clear of me. I'm positive. No, we'd rather you were home and somebody else was walking the dog. So there's lots of things that we can talk about now that we'll forget 10, five years from now or even a year from now. So uh, just keep checking your email. We'll be sending out things as it is interesting. So okay. Okay. Thanks, Catherine, huh? can I, can I uh, interrupt and just say one thing? What? <clears throat> I, I am delighted that you're having this virtual presentation because I'm actually in Florida. <laughs> And if this were in person in Chicago, I would not be able to attend. Yeah. Now you get the best of both worlds with the weather and the talk. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, yep. And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad for you, Ron. So, okay. So our speaker today, um, Cynthia Clampett and I went last year to the Midwest during history conference, which is now canceled for this year because of you know what. And... Cynthia was doing a talk about pigs and corn, and Sam was doing a talk about Marengo, Illinois, and he was rather pleased. We were two people who'd actually been to Marengo, Illinois. So immediately <laughs> when I got home, I contacted the uh, McHenry Historical Society because they were all they were thrilled also to deal with this. So you know, in fact, if the, the way this program was planned, I know we don't usually meet on Sundays. But it was originally supposed to be Sunday today here, and then tomorrow it was going to be at uh, the McHenry. But mm -hmm. we decided to continue on and do it virtually. First of all, because it's a learning experience, but next year or whenever it's re um, scheduled with McHenry County, we'll do it in Highland Park at the same time as well. But this is our, our learning experience. So there I'm going to turn it over to Sam, who I'm so thrilled is here today. And by the way, well, he had an you. owie on his finger last night. I, so I, I did. I, I managed to to slice my hand open. Don't cut bread, like you know. So it's just it's always a bad idea. Never good. You you get stitches. So. You sure do. Yeah, uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Sam, who's going to tell you a bit about himself and about his project. Yeah. So thank you, Kathy, so much for for having me for this. This is really a lot of fun. It's it, it's. It's a lot different than with a conference. You know, you apply and you try to get your stuff in and you hope people will be interested, but it's, uh, I'm really grateful for an opportunity to share this with you guys. Uh, you've expressed interest to hear about the project. And, and like you were saying that 
uh, back at the Midwestern History Conference, just hearing that, oh, there are people who have been to Marengo in McHenry County, which my, my paper is about, um, made it made it really special. So I'm, I'm really happy to share with you guys. But about me, so um, I'm a PhD candidate in American history over at St. Louis University uh, here in St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm in my fourth of five years. So I've gone through the master's stuff. I did the comprehensive exams where you read the 200 books and take the terribly long exams. Um, and I'm currently writing my dissertation um, on farms that functioned like prisons uh, during World War II. And, and today we're gonna talk a little bit about the system in general, and then uh, largely about what was happening there uh, in McHenry County in Marengo. Um, but I've got, as far as the dissertation goes, I've got one chapter done. Uh, the second chapter, which actually deals largely with uh, Marengo, uh, is, is what I'm working on right now. And then hopefully, fingers crossed, and, and COVID allowing, uh, I'll be done next May. So yeah, that's me. But if, if everyone's good, we can just go on in. And, and I see Kathy's not, not sitting there. Maybe I'll wait a second for Kathy to come back. And then she won't miss anything. That'd be good. Let's see, we've got a lot of people here. And Kathy's still not here. Um, other things about me, I recently got married. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, just right before the world shut down, actually, on March 14th. So about two days later, the uh, they decided to limit meetings to 50 uh, or less in St. Louis. And uh, we had about 100 people. So we got in just under the wire and no one got sick. So that's also very positive. Um, okay, I, I don't see Kathy, but I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and, Kathy. oh, there's Kathy. There's, okay. You're back. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started here. I'm gonna share my screen for the presentation here. All right, and everyone can see that. So away we go. All right, so um, my presentation today uh, is called Caging Potato Fields, uh, Carceral Agriculture in Marengo, Illinois, uh, during World War II. So uh, on April 21st, 1943, word reached Illinois that American airmen captured over Japan in the previous year's Doolittle Raid had been executed. Now the Doolittle Raid uh, there are some American bombers that went over Japan, they dropped some bombs, some of them went down and were captured. So these men had just been executed uh, in 1943. And just outside Chicago and Marengo, uh, fallen sons and brothers had made this war against Japan uh, very personal. So on the heels of this Doolittle news, uh, Marengo opened its papers the following day, discovered and baffled, to discover baffled that 16 Japanese Americans were on their way to town. Uh, now, forcibly expelled from their homes and incarcerated in desert camps, the war was personal for these exiles as well. Uh, while their own fields in Washington rotted or benefited others, uh, these Japanese Americans now were employed for the Curtis Candy Company, uh, cultivating potatoes and other vegetables under contract with the War Relocation Authority. Uh, and I'll be referring to them as the WRA uh, in this paper. Uh, and though Marengo was not home, it was also not enclosed with barbed wire like the internment camps where they had been living. So really a sort of tentative hope had driven these, these Japanese Americans, these exiles to Illinois. Uh, but many Marengo residents saw their arrival as a disaster. Uh, so the ensuing weeks uh, through late April and early May of 1943 uh, saw lots of public conflict, debate, uh, removal and return that would determine these newcomers' status in the community. Uh, so today I'd like to propose that in 1943, uh, Marengo residents negotiated with private contractors and federal agencies to create a kind of unfree or carceral landscape amid wartime food demands. Now, I, I don't know if anyone's heard the term carceral or, or not, um, but Essentially, uh, it's a term that relates to prisons uh, or things that are prison-like or pertain to incarceration. Um, so it's kind of like the, the adjective form of incarceration. So for our purposes today, an unfree or carceral landscape emerges when people 
and built structures and nature are configured to contain and restrict particular groups. So the landscape can be reinterpreted, reassembled, and deployed as a cage or as a tool for disciplining people. Now, this was the case in Marengo and across many other farms uh, in the Midwest uh, and sometimes beyond the Midwest during World War II. Uh, the fields, packing sheds, and canneries of Midwestern foodways uh, received several different groups of variously restricted laborers, whether these Japanese Americans, uh, German and Italian prisoners of war, or Mexican and Jamaican migrants. Now, each receiving community, such as Marengo and others, uh, negotiated the place of incoming laborers, uh, choosing and assembling federal policies, uh, civic attitudes, and uh, engaging with the limits of food production to make uh, sort of organic cages, in a way, uh, of American farms. Um, and the appearances and degrees of this phenomenon varied uh, considerably uh, across the Midwest, but the aggregate impact was felt uh, from Arkansas to Wisconsin to Michigan to Kentucky, uh, sometimes all the way out in Connecticut, um, under this common sign of uh, restriction, sometimes disenfranchisement, and these built structures and landscapes that, that reflected this. Um, so my paper or presentation today uh, will use some newspaper clippings and oral histories. And uh, actually, Ka Kathy, since the last time I gave this, uh, I've made a trip to the National Archives in DC. So we've got some extra stuff from there too, um, to really examine how one such unfree landscape came to restrict the Curtis Candy Company's laborers in Marengo potato fields. All right, so a little backstory. During the New Deal, um, there was a certain paradigm for using uh, farm labor. Um, and this no longer sufficed during wartime. So during the New Deal, in, in short, I could go on for a while about this, but there were massive surpluses of laborers in agriculture, just given the massive unemployment that was present in the United States during the, 19, uh, the 1930s. Um, but now uh, the federal government was facing uh, you know, the sh shortage rather than surplus. Uh, and from planters to federal commissions and senators, this shortage really stoked uh, intense anxiety in the waning months of 1942, uh, because the nation was going you know, into, into wartime conflict. Uh, and the food supply, the soil, the war's caloric elements, you, you need to eat, you need to feed soldiers, uh, right? Um, these seemed insecure without enough labor. Uh, so for example here, let's see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. So for fr future President Harry Truman, uh, food security meant keeping laborers in fields uh, as tools of a sort. Uh, so he was addressing the Massachusetts Federation of Taxpayer Associations, very exciting uh, meeting, I'm sure, uh, as a Missouri senator on December 2nd, 1942. And Truman argued that agriculture played a major role in the growing conflict. So farmers, he proposed, this is a quote, uh, are engaged in a vital war effort. We cannot expect them to make bricks without straw, and we must take steps now to ensure maintenance of their labor supply and to equip them with the farm machinery and other things that they require to maintain their production. That's the end of the quote. Um, and Truman acknowledged that farms fundamentally relied upon bodies and machine, bodies and machines in motion upon the land, and that any substantial government intervention for growers, for farmers, would really necessitate a, a, a greater federal presence in rural America to make this happen. So some federal agency would have to move beyond infrastructure creation and be empowered to enforce these sorts of labor relations. And so to that end, uh, some bureaucrats considered applying military tactics to the food front. Uh, and that's the, the gentleman there uh, on the right, uh, Paul McNutt was one of these. So in September of 1942, uh, the House Agriculture Committee listened to an update from Paul V. McNutt, the head of the newly established War Manpower Commission about the country's farm situation. According to McNutt, pers quote, persuasion is not enough and there's not sufficient patriotic urge, end quote, to pull civilians into, into critical wartime industries that were unmanned, like agriculture. 
Um, so he actually, along with some others, suggested uh, doing a, a National Service Act or like a draft uh, to get workers into agriculture. Um, you know, and the draft was believed to be effective, right, when compelling citizens to fight. Um, but labor, particularly in farms, was starting to be seen in sort of a parallel fashion. So as they entered 1943, uh, the growing draw of uh, war factories and the draft uh, really started to intensify uh, these agricultural fears. Uh, the Associated Press actually uh, was arguing that the land army, uh, quote, engaged in this battle to fill the civilian's plate and the soldier's mess kit is massive but shorthanded, end quote. Uh, citing that uh, a survey that identified an agricultural labor shortage in most states and that states like Ohio, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, and Illinois uh, could expect a crisis at harvest time. Uh, so this is at the very beginning of 1943. And, and these fears weren't ungrounded. Um, I did some research with uh, the Federal Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, and they keep statistics on, um, on, on labor numbers in a, very, a variety of different uh, sectors, including agriculture. And, uh, between 1941 and 1945, uh, American foodways, so farms, canneries, uh, different factories related to food, uh, lost a net 603,000 workers uh, but there between 1941 and 1945, despite a lot of policy efforts to the contrary. Um, and while such concerns were unheard of during economic depression, uh, policymakers were really worried that labor deficits could create food shortage and loss on the ward's caloric front. So what to do? Now, the federal government did have a reserve of idle bodies at its disposal held behind barbed wire. Now, after Pearl Harbor, federal, uh, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 in February, in February of 1942. Uh, and I know some of you may be familiar with this, but this directed the military uh, to move uh, over 120,000 Japanese Americans from their homes along the West Coast and detain them indefinitely uh, in camps run by the, the aforementioned War Relocation Authority, or WRA. Now, some detainees were immediately deployed to conservation projects. Um, the, the WRA built most of these camps in pretty arid landscapes. Uh, in deserts, uh, including the, the one that's uh, pictured here, uh, the Thule Lake Relocation Camp in Northern California. Now, the WRA intended with this to create arable land, right, to, to create land that would be used for farmers, it would be brought into food production for the country, and then once the war was over, um, other farmers could come in and start using that land. Um, but unlike the farms, uh, there were farm camps also created under the New Deal that you could kind of see this as similar to. Uh, but the major difference here being uh, that these camps were formal prisons uh, that, that kept the Japanese Americans here uh, against their will. They, they could not leave, right? Um, they couldn't necessarily be forced to work either. Uh, but when faced with living inside barbed wire fences or cultivating plants outside the camp, uh, many made the rather limited decision uh, to work. Now, the federal government's food agencies took notice of this large immobile population in late 1942 and initiated a research effort to determine whether Japanese Americans should be used on American farms. And that report uh, farmers' attitudes towards the use of Japanese evacuees as farm laborers uh, was produced with uh, the Bureau of Agricultural Economics. Um, and federal authorities suspected that there would be backlash and resistance against using Japanese Americans as cultivators. Um, so the survey worked to pinpoint particular sticking points and suggest tactics for federal administrators when dealing with local communities. And the results were really striking, uh, actually, in that farmers consistently expressed uh, varying degrees uh, of resistance towards Japanese Americans, which grew more uniform and intense as surveyors looked to the Midwest uh, and East. Surveyors found respondents in the West and Pacific Northwest generally holding mixed attitudes towards Japanese Americans. 
um, some, uh, like a, a Czech woman in New Mexico, uh, mused that she didn't, quote, see what is wrong with them. They have done nothing wrong. This is their home too, uh, end quote. Others uh, bluntly threatened violence, uh, as an El Paso farmer who said, quote, I wouldn't have a goddamn Jap on my place. I might kill him, end quote. Uh, the Midwest was likewise mixed, uh, though acceptance was rarely on the table. Um, a Medina County, Ohio farmer admitted that he wouldn't, quote, want no part of anything like that, uh, even though personally I have nothing against people like that, end quote. Um, but a Carroll County, Missouri rancher did take it very personally, saying, quote, if you want some Japs killed, send them here. I would rather let my farm lie idle before I will take any Jap labor, end quote. Now, such threats were really serious to these federal surveyors on two levels. The most obvious being the potential endangerment to Japanese American lives, but the farmers were also willing to let their land go fallow and unused, which was really the capital sin of 1930s and 40s farming. Uh, you've got to keep the land used. Um, so uh, similarly, uh, really even more uh, violent things were heard the further east you went. Uh, in New Jersey, uh, a truck farmer uh, uh, re recommended that they, quote, take some of the bitches out and shoot them, end quote. So really some pretty vitriolic things. Uh, the farther removed farmers were from the West Coast in contact with Japanese Americans, the more vehement and violent their resistance. Um, such resistance to Japanese Americans was often racially motivated. Um, the surveyors also designated uh, a significant proportion of respondents as hesitant to use Japanese Americans according to labor efficiency standards. Um, and this proportion um, swung dr drastically toward racial and national prejudices as surveyors turned eastwards. So um, the, the more removed they were from contact, again, the, the greater this sort of racial resistance was. Um, and the WRA, they had this suspicion that if only the Midwest and the East got into actual like interpersonal contact with Japanese Americans, that they would probably change their mind, that they would see they were fellow farmers and that everything would work out more or less okay. Um, so they'd have to send them in small groups and, and not all at once. Um, but they knew there would be resistance. Now, Japanese Americans in Tule Lake, California were told a very different story. Uh, the Daily Tulean Dispatch, that was their, their official newspaper, uh, it urged its residents to participate in a farm relocation project program, which would send uh, Japanese Americans to farms in the Midwest. Uh, their editors, who often towed the official line uh, of the federal government, said that, um, let me find the, the right quote here, um, but essentially, uh, quote, instead of waiting after the war, the WRA has instituted a program of rehabilitation now by means of the resettlement through private employment on the outside. This is the future that we've been advising colonists to look forward to and to forget the past. Um, and they go down and say, you know, that we believe in true Americanism and it stands for all, equality, liberty, and justice for all, regardless of religion, creed, or race, will win out. And because we believe in this dictum, we urge all colonists, uh, speaking about all the people in Tule Lake, um, to be, get prepared mentally and emotionally to go outside again without fear to become a part and parcel of the great American community, end quote. So this was the message that Japanese Americans were given in Tule Lake, uh, that this was an opportunity with little risk, uh, really nothing to lose, uh, even though federal authorities in charge of this relocation effort were well aware that community resistance in the Midwest could actually be quite severe. So that gets us to McHenry County, uh, when Earl Ishino and the Sukuma brothers journeyed from Tule Lake to Marengo. Um, now there, uh, the existing landscape had no place for Japanese Americans, or, or so some rather resentful voices uh, cried out. So on Thursday, April 22nd, 1943, an anonymous writer brushed a cryptic note to the Chicago Tribune saying that 
quote, feelings were running high here, end quote, over the first three detainees' arrival in Marengo. In the Chicago Tribune's subsequent Sunday article, uh, Mayor, uh, Marengo Mayor W.L. Miller argued that, quote, these may be good people and entitled to respect as American citizens, but I don't think they should be allowed to come to town. Too many people here have boys in the service and they just don't like having Japs around, end quote. Now, while highly touted by the Curtis Can Candy Company and WRA as thoroughly investigated and master farmers, um, racial and political attitudes uh, obstructed Japanese Americans uh, community membership and their labor. Uh, quote, they may be good citizens, uh, said Park Board President and American Legion Commander Charles H. Doolittle, uh, quote, but it is just their tough luck that they have Japanese ancestry, end quote. Other res residents in Marengo expressed their resentment a little bit more concretely. Uh, Ray McAndrews, whose son died in action four months prior, uh, told papers that, quote, hell would be a poppin end quote, if Japanese Americans stayed. Now, while the town's poli police promised protection if requested, unrest was clearly present in Marengo. And, and such attitudes initially uh, prevailed. Stunned at Sunday's spiraling developments, uh, Curtis Candy Company President Otto Schnering held a secret late night meeting with Mayor Miller, Doolittle, and industrial relations counselors. And no record remains directly of their gathering, uh, but immediately, but immediately after, uh, they pulled Earl Ashino and the brothers at Sousa and Sakusa Sakuma, uh, pictured there on the PowerPoint, uh, from preparing seed potatoes to wait in a Chicago hotel, or at least until things in Marengo cooled down. Now, this removal was quite a blow to Ashino and the Sakuma brothers. Having already worked for a number of days, uh, they had been largely confined to the farm and were unaware of both military news and the community angst. Uh, Ashino uh, said, quote, we were assured by war relocation authority representatives that the community would accept us, end quote. So he's rather frustrated there uh, because these fields had promised really a fresh start beyond the barbed wire fences uh, of Tule Lake and of other relocation centers. Uh, but now, sitting deflated in a hotel room, uh, Ashino admitted that he only wanted to feel, quote, welcome as American citizens and fellow farmers, end quote. But as Doolittle had made clear, citizenship was insufficient in Marengo. Now, outraged, uh, Marengo's religious leaders gathered to sway the town's attitudes on the detainees' behalf. Uh, contesting Doolittle's assertion over citizenship, five pastors wrote to the Marengo Republican News on Tuesday that, quote, our belief in Christianity and in democracy impels us to respect and defend the rights of all citizens, including Americans with Japanese faces, end quote. And they expressed hope that, quote, all responsible citizens of the community share our attitude, end quote. So these pastors positioned citizenship and Christianity as a sort of cult, common cultural ground uh, between them and the Japanese Americans, shared qualities that could allow coexistence in Marengo. Uh, now, ideological and moral integration did not exclude divisive land and labor configurations. In the same day as the pastor's statement, uh, the Marengo Kiwanis Club received a Curtis plan to restrict Japanese American workers. The company planned to, quote, keep them on the farm, uh, except for minimum supply runs, uh, bring ministers to the dormitory barn rather than bus workers to church, and replace Japanese Americans with, quote, Marengo young men as soon as the war ends, end quote. So monitored and restrained within the farm's boundaries, not to mention the ongoing prohibition against returning home to, to, to California or to Washington, uh, the proposed conditions bore semblance to actually earlier convict lease labor systems. Uh, in the 19th century, many states actually encouraged industrial, industrial employers uh, to contract with prisons for convict laborers. And this kind of cheap disciplined labor was extremely attractive uh, because the state would guarantee that the lease uh, was fulfilled. Um, the Curtis Candy Company similarly set labor terms, movement limits, and community restrictions for the incoming Japanese Americans 
under WRA guaranteed contracts. And proven useful in past precedents, the, the Curtis Candy Company and WRA brought these carceral or unfree terms to Marengo negotiations as the planting season drew near. Now, this is where things get kind of fun here. Uh, Marengo's potatoes were what silently pushed for resolution to the labor debates. Uh, exasperated by a week of stalemates, uh, Schnerig, the, the Curtis Candy Company president, uh, explained to Marengo Papers that his company responded to a natural imperative. Uh, quote, there is no intention on our part to establish a permanent Japanese American colony near Marengo, Schnerig said. Uh, we accept, we we agreed to accept these workers upon the request of the War Relocation Authority because of the shortage of farm labor and the need for immediate spring planting in connection with the company's farm operation, which is part of our cooperation in the nation's food program." End quote. So Schnerig spoke to a particular natural problem. Uh, now, in my understanding, uh, root tubers like sweet potatoes are hardy, less susceptible to human events. Uh, some varieties are able to lie dormant for prolonged periods of time, even years. Uh, but as stem tubers with shorter growth cycles and susceptible, susceptibility to ecological conditions, Marengo's uh, potatoes, ideal planting time, early spring, was slipping away. Now, food's wartime role compounded uh, this agricultural uh, imperative with those labor numbers that I had been discussing earlier, right? Um, you, you need the food for the war front. The potatoes are being touted as like the new savior of uh, American food waste. They were, I think I have, I don't know if I have it here in the articles on the slide, but they were talking about potatoes being like the new meat. Uh, you could eat potatoes, not, I mean, they have totally different nutrient profiles, but in any case. Um, so workers were ultimately available right, in the form of Japanese Americans and others, source and price had simply become key. Um, so farmers' needs and incarcerated bodies seemed like natural partners to the WRA and private contractors like the Curtis Candy Company. But that fantasy, that ideal world, was starting to fade as time slipped away for planting and planters. Now, the ordeal that began on April 24th finally came to a head on May 4th at a city council meeting where Marengo residents could democratically seal Japanese Americans' place. National and local journalists, uh, WRA officials, uh, Curtis Candy Company representatives, and nearly the whole of Marengo attended. Uh, and actually among those WRA officials, uh, this is a, a rather ironic twist that I've found out uh, in recent months of research. Um, but uh, the Chicago manager, the Chicago head of uh, the WRA, uh, uh, Elmer Sherrill uh, had actually been uh, the head of Thule Lake Relocation Center uh, during the whole of 1942. Um, and so the laborers who were coming to work for the, the Curtis Candy Company actually had prior experience with him as, as their, uh, the head of their camp. Uh, so now he's here in Marengo dealing with, with these conflicts. In any case, um, so at this meeting, uh, the crowd ballooned so severely that the mayor had to move everyone from City Hall to a community center uh, down the road where, despite the larger space, participants spilled out of the chamber and into the hallways. Um, so debate began when the WRA, uh, Elmer Sherrill, uh, called for understanding. Uh, mayor Miller then accused the Chicago Tribune of, of false reporting, fake news accusations are everywhere, right? Uh, pastors reiterated their statement on citizenship, uh, and a Curtis representative waved a sheaf of letters and telegrams claiming that practically all were favorable. Oh, everyone wanted them there. Um, a survey then revealed that 60% of Marengo's residents opposed the Japanese Americans. Uh, a survey of high schoolers polled the complete opposite. Uh, and one resident remarked to much applause that, quote, the issue is not is, is whether or not we want them living in our community. And personally, I don't. I am willing to uphold their rights, but I would rather fight for them in Marengo while they lived in Arkansas or Idaho, end quote. So this kind of stalemate swirled for hours as a very unseasonable warmth it just kind of crawled on. Uh, residents gridlocked the terms uh, when the mayor called for a vote. Everyone knows what we are voting on, said the beleaguered mayor. 
and, and but redefining this landscape, right? Uh, the terms of this community's physical space, it, it made for rather wary business. Now, food made the decisive appeal. Um, a Dr. H.E. Uh, Vanderveen, I believe it was Henry, uh, stood to remind the room that, quote, food was vital for victory and that these Japanese Americans could contribute to the war effort. Nothing should stop us in doing everything possible to produce food for victory, end quote. So caloric imperatives remained whether or not Marengo welcomed new neighbors. Boundaries could be erected, movement restricted, mandates imposed, but Marengo's fundamental problem remained organic, which is what he reminded them of. So ballots were distributed, collected, and counted, and while many people abstained, voters decided 62 to 21 to receive the 16 Japanese Americans uh, that were waiting uh, in Chicago. Uh, so Marengo inscribed a new configuration of people, plants, and boundaries in its landscape as food security uh, tended to outweigh racial biases. Um, but the clearest plans uh, never persist unaltered, and, and perhaps this is good, right? So Ashino, the Sukuma brothers, and another 13 Japanese Americans uh, did enter their new landscape under close supervision. And, and initially it was pretty tight. So looking back in the 1990s, uh, Thomas Komatani uh, uh, remembered, quote, hating going out in public because of being so self-conscious, end quote, uh, after WRA officials had directed Japanese Americans to make yourselves inconspicuous and to avoid group movement. And, and children and adults alike bore this uh, rather disciplinary gaze, but Marengo softened. So one of the pastors who had been advocating for their entry, uh, Inel Godby, uh, he recalled introducing the Komatani family uh, to his Baptist congregation. Uh, things were a little tense for a moment, recalled Godby, but when the service was over, I was never so proud of the church in all my life. They nearly fell over to reach out to them and make them welcome, and, end quote there. Uh, so interpersonal contact, uh, actually coming to know people, uh, enabled residents and detainees to bridge uh, these contentious divides. Um, nevertheless, though, uh, the federal government's oversight continued to persist underneath such accommodations, and Japanese Americans could not return home uh, to the West Coast. So explicit limits and imprisonment in the incarceration camps uh, had been substituted with disciplined behavior and surveillance. So the Japanese Americans uh, were not entirely free to go. Now, the federal government crafted uh, its own Marengo landscape with cameras. Uh, some of the images actually here. Um, the War Relocation Authority's photographic section, or RAPS, was responsible for photographing the WRA's release program uh, for display to relocation camp residents and the wider American public. Uh, so these programs and their captions visually and verbally interpreted the WRA relocation program for camp inhabitants and, and everyone else, crediting the program as humane while encouraging detainees to take labor contracts outside the camps. So Charles Mace, uh, the director of RAPS, actually took his camera to Marengo uh, in July of 1943, a, a few months after all of this conflict. And his images tell a narrative of productivity and harmony. Uh, you don't see any barracks or barbed wire, uh, no longer suspect insurgents. Uh, the boys of various relocation centers uh, just work uh, among Illinois potatoes. Uh, the Japanese Americans are portrayed as patriotic soldiers of the food front. Uh, Toreo Heano uh, is depicted uh, in that one photo as mixing lime and copper sulfate to kill off potato bite, and Atsuza Sukuma uh, in the second photo is pictured uh, learning a new method of irrigation. So free Japanese Americans wield technology against national hunger and foreign foes alike. That's, that's the depiction uh, in this federal interpretation where Marengo fields are open, faces are smiling, and the labor is intent. Um, but Mace's message conceals as much as it tells. So all traces of spring uh, conflicts and the ensuing boundaries are invisible. Uh, and save for mentions of, of the camp origins where they came from, uh, reminders of restriction uh, are absent. 
Now, here we're coming up on, on my last part here. So if Japanese Americans inhabited a, a gray area between freedom and incarceration, German war prisoners carried a uh, formal caging to Marengo landscapes. So 10 days after this whole voting kerfuffle, rumors started to surface of POW barracks at nearby Camp Grant. Uh, and these rumors in May bore true in September uh, as 60 to 90 Camp Grant POWs entered the potato harvest workforce uh, with large PW markings on their clothes and armed guards at their sides. So Arango's uh, unfree landscape incorporated Japanese Americans and Germans alike, and, and the nation noticed. Uh, from Illinois to Delaware, variations on Jap Americans serve food to Hun prisoners, as you can see there uh, on the slide, crossed headlines in September of 1943. So labor and meals uh, assembled the landscape's crops and peoples, humans feeding plants and plants feeding humans and supervised fields and surveilled mess halls, composing a, a common material and social enclosure. Now, Marengo uh, feared Japanese Americans for reasons of racial identity, but German POWs, real enemy combatants whose presence depended upon wartime violence, entered the community as curiosities. So Ernst Flüter, uh, a German POW who was captured after Normandy, uh, he recalled that, quote, every morning a Cadillac came up, a rich looking couple came out and she gave out baby Ruth candies to everybody, uh, end quote. Uh, Schnering, who had contracted uh, the Japanese Americans, even tried his German on the prisoners. Uh, it was fantastic, mused Flüter, uh, the whole prisoner of wartime, end quote. Uh, the Nazi threat seemed defanged uh, by these carceral structures of armed guards, prison clothing, and the barracks. Um, and on top of that, the Germans were white, which meant their presence did not shift Marengo's racial status quo. Um, since the Germans could not leave, return home, earn wages, choose their clothing, or determine their own food, Marengo saw POWs as neutralized threats. Uh, but a humane cage remains a cage nevertheless, and those fundamental limits uh, underpinned flexible rules and attitudes. Now, most Japanese Americans and all of the Germans uh, left Marengo when the war ended, but many material and human consequences endured afterwards. Uh, the potato fields continued to operate until 1950 with Japanese American labor, uh, and the Komatani family uh, mentioned before uh, made Marengo their home well into the 1990s, uh, possibly after. Uh, a daughter in the Yeda family who also stayed in Marengo eventually became the town's homecoming queen. Uh, so allowing the 1940s and the conflict there to fade beneath new memories made community life possible. But these trajectories were still grounded in wartime experiences. So moving beyond Marengo here, just to conclude, World War II proliferated unfree landscapes across the United States, bringing together private contractors and federal agencies through intensified cultivation and confined bodies. The rules and attitudes of unfree agriculture conf configured the plants, peoples, and built structures of rural foodscapes uh, food landscapes to cultivate farm fields in cages. While temporary, this landscape and landscape system was a lived reality among the Curtis Candy Company's potatoes and their potato fields. Uh, caged life include the sun and the wind and occasional candy bars uh, alongside explicit limits, uh, omnipresent scrutiny and surveillance, and, and armed guards even. And while this prison eventually withered when cut off from federal funding and the war crises, uh, its physical and psychological imprints remained in landscapes and minds and bodies. And Marengo and other contemporary cases uh, thus provide alternative avenues uh, for studying uh, the carceral state or the emergence of uh, federal prison programs. Uh, so well before the war on terror or war on drugs or war on poverty, World War II drove a mass uh, carceral system uh, through American agriculture. And while temporary, uh, this prison-like framework survived wartime in the ongoing environmental drama of cultivation in, in rural American foodscapes. 
Um, and which is what I'm trying to figure out with my dissertation too. Um, so with that, uh, that's everything that I've, I've prepared here. Um, I, I'd be happy to take any questions now at this point. People might be able to unmute themselves and ask a question. I, I believe they can, yes. Okay. Somebody out there in TV land want to say something? Yeah, I'll say something. Excellent. Sam, uh, where else in the country uh, was uh, prison labor used in agriculture? Um, everywhere, I mean, it, largely in the Midwest um, and sometimes in the East and in the South. Um, so for my dissertation, I'm currently looking um, at four or five different locations in particular. Uh, Marengo is one of them. Um, Chesterfield, Missouri, which is just outside St. Louis, so it's very convenient for me. Uh, that's one of the other places that I'm looking at. Um, there were farms in Indiana, all, all across Indiana, that were using German POWs. Um, Michigan, Ohio. I'm looking at a place, uh, Holdridge, Nebraska, as well. Uh, and then also uh, down in Arkansas, uh, they had a couple of uh, Japanese American uh, internment camps that later held uh, German prisoners of war as well. Um, so those are a, a, just a, a sampling of the places, uh, but really I found throughout my research, you know, from Idaho, there were uh, uh, Japanese Americans working fields in Idaho, uh, all the way out to, you know, Connecticut uh, with varying degrees of restriction. And, and so were the, the German POWs that in the slide that I had, I, I can, I think I'm still sharing it, but the, the, enemy, the enemies in our midst uh, image uh, there in the top left, uh, all the blue dots there are different uh, German uh, uh, prison camps uh, where we held German prisoners of war, um, which often were using them in agriculture as well. So uh, long story short, it, it was a pretty widespread uh, phenomenon. Thank you. I remember uh, visiting a gift shop in Door County uh, that was formerly uh, dormitories for German prisoners of war. Okay, sure. Yeah, it, it, things like that are, 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 are fairly common from what I've, I understand. Well, uh, Fort Sheridan, in, where Highland Park is adjacent to Fort Sheridan, um, okay. they had Italians, they had German POWs, um, they even had like four acres of land available for them to grow vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom, who's sitting in with me right now, she took a tour at one point at Fort Sheridan and was told that some of the, like, the housewives, you know, that were there waiting for the husbands or whatever, uh, would uh, like to have good, good enough relations to be able to get some of those fresh fruits and vegetables that the, the Germans were growing. Oh, how convenient. I don't think, I don't think, and there, maybe there's people here from this region who know better, but I did not get the impression that at least at that location it wasn't farming. They did other projects, but not, not farming. Which also was the case, uh, like in northern Michigan, um, sometimes prisoners of war were deployed to uh, forestry projects. Um, they didn't like to have them logging because it was too dangerous for them, and you can't, you can't really uh, keep a forest uh, surveilled very easily. They could just disappear into the trees, which is why farming was so attractive, right? You, you're in a flat open space. You can watch them very easily with fewer people, fewer soldiers. Um, but there were some cases where they were used in um, in some forestry projects, uh, northern Michigan, uh, canneries as well. You know, put the tomatoes in the cans. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't always farms. So. Just wanted to let you know we're coming to you from Marengo, where we live. Excellent. Yes, <laughs> and um, so we're. Needless to say, intimately involved with uh, with what's going on here. Absolutely, uh, the Curtis Candy Company was out uh, just a little south of us here on a road called Burma Road, uh, which is not normally the type of uh, naming that that it happens around here. Sure. Uh, my um, we we know some of the descendants from uh, some of the uh, the camps. I. I bowl on a team with uh, with Jesse, who's uh, who's Japanese American, and uh, used to have a uh, department store that uh, had a lot of very good Japanese American uh, customers. That's amazing. Uh, 
Um, one let you know though, uh, one besides racism, one of the, one of the other uh, uh, big factors with uh, uh, the Germans in town is mm. that uh, Marengo is a, a largely German area mm -hmm. as well. So, uh, so I, that factored it a lot. <laughs> it did, and you know, it's fascinating. I was just thinking about that as I was preparing for this. I was I was going over some of the newspapers. Uh, that I was getting this, some of this from uh, in the 1940s. And uh, so many, so they, that I mentioned there was a, a survey of high schoolers done uh, about whether or not they should allow the, the Japanese Americans in. And many of the high schoolers were extremely positive and saying that we should allow the Japanese Americans into Marengo. And one of the reasons that they consistently cited was one, that they're citizens just like us and two, we mistreated Germans so poorly during World War I, uh, and we shouldn't go through that again with these people. And so many of the, the, the children, the high schoolers who were saying this, had very German last names. Uh, so you could tell they had some sort of familial experience uh, with this. Um, so there was a kind of, not only was there, there racism in a sense going on on the negative side, but there's also this, this interracial solidarity or common experience uh, that many of the high schoolers uh, and people of German heritage were also able to, to call upon here. Yeah, that's really interesting actually. Yeah. Uh, Ringo is still a very rural, Republican, uh, sheltered kind of place. Sure. Uh, and it still had, but like I said, the Japanese Americans have, although there's not a lot of them, uh, have certainly integrated really well. Uh, the Mexican Americans from around here took a long time for them to really be, get integrated into the community. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we don't have a lot of blacks, we don't have a lot of Muslims, that sort sure. of thing. But sure. um, we have some, though. We have some. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, and and you know, I'd just like to say there too, like on, on the integration front. And I've seen this a few other places, but you know when, and I've actually seen this for uh, in Chesterfield here in Missouri with uh, Latino migrants uh, who experienced uh, some discrimination and, and poor work conditions. Um, that after a while, like there are these negative experiences uh, that are tragic and and disturbing on some levels, um, whether it's exclusion or being thrown out or being forced to work eighteen hour days. Um, but as time goes on, many of these people find ways uh, to, to make these places their homes, uh, to humanize them uh, really pretty significantly. Um, so in, in Chesterfield, I, I spoke with uh, some, some Mexican migrants uh, whose father uh, had worked on this farm, and they had nothing but good things to say about the community. Uh, they really had no sort of uh, present recollection uh, of some of the problems from like the 1950s. Um, and I think that's important. Like on some levels, we, we, we struggle with this as historians, right? We, we work in the past, we try to remember things. And on the other hand, in per people's personal lives, uh, forgetting is sometimes the way to, to getting by and to making new relationships with people. Um, so we, we walked that balance there, right? Of like, what was this moment? Why was it important? But, but what did they ultimately make out of it themselves in their own personal lives can, can, can diverge quite significantly, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, can I ask, uh, were, they, were the uh, prisoners paid anything? Um, for the so, sometimes they were paid in canteen credits. Um, you, could, you could probably get another uh, another slice of bread or what, whatever they were serving that day in the prisoner of war canteen. Um, they were not paid cash though. Um, essentially you'd, you'd be paid, um, you'd, be, you'd be paid in, in, in food credits more or less. Um, the, the federal government took a slice of their pay uh, in order, they justified it as, uh, um, you know, just general upkeep of the prison quarters and such. Uh, you know, they'd use it for maintenance and, and whatnot, um, but they didn't get paid cash. Some farmers did uh, incentivize prisoners of war to work more. Uh, so uh, there's this one fellow uh, who 
told them they'd get extra extra meal rations. He'd, he'd give them even more food outside of what the, the army was giving them if they worked a few more hours here and there. Um, so you'd see that sometimes too. A question. Yeah. Well, with the Japanese Americans who were there, did they get um, some sort of room and board or a chance to uh, um, work their own crops or what, what was part of their deal? Right. Okay. So initially, uh, the Japanese Americans uh, in Marengo, uh, they were given, uh, they called it a dormitory. Um, it, it was essentially a large house uh, that uh, was repurposed for them to live in. Um, it may not have been, I, I'm not quite sure what its condition was before uh, they came in. Um, eventually, uh, probably after 1943, um, some of the families that came to Marengo moved into different houses. Um, I know that uh, in some locations, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure entirely on, on the, the particular trajectory in Marengo, still working this out, but in other places, many Japanese Americans after 1943, so 1944, 45, started trying to buy their own land uh, and to work their own fields. Uh, in Marengo, it seems that they continued to be employed by the Curtis Candy Company and work their fields. Um, oh, and then work alongside the, the German POWs. Um, sometimes in the fields, other times it seems uh, like with the newspapers I showed, um, they were engaged in, in feeding them. So they were still employed by the, the Curtis Candy Company, but they'd be kind of working in the back end uh, in the kitchens. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, by the way, Nicholas, why don't you tell people where you're coming from right now? I'm in Olympia, Washington right now. <laughs> oh, wow. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Hey, my pleasure. Yeah, we have somebody from Florida. We got you in Washington. Marengo. And out here in Missouri, we got some family in Indiana. Oh, yeah. Good times. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any, anybody else have any questions? I have a, a question. Um, approximately how many prisoners were in the United States during World War II? and how many were in Marengo? And then a second question, mm -hmm. there's a major, I, I guess there was a major railroad junction in Union, which was pretty close to Marengo. Correct. And was there any uh, interchange between the Marengo and Union uh, communities? Hmm. I don't, I, to that last point on Marengo and Union connections, I, I don't know. I, I know that Union was very much aware of what was happening in Marengo. They, they published in their newspapers pretty consistently uh, about the happenings there. Um, as far as numbers of German POWs in the United States, I believe it was upwards of 400,000 uh, at one point uh, across the U.S. Um, it, it may have been a bit more. Um, for some reason, 400,000, 423,000 is what's coming to mind, um, but I, I can get that exact number. Um, and then in Marengo, uh, there were about 90 to 100 that would come and work for the Curtis Candy Company, uh, but Camp Grant, um, I, I believe, held uh, at least, I don't know, substantially more, but they had room for, for quite a bit more than 94. So I hope that answers that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Just wanted to say that uh, Union's only about three miles away from Ringo, or basically our, our suburb. And that, all, that would make no, sense. I don't think I'd call it that. But the students from Union would go to Marengo High School. They had their own mm. grade school there, okay. but they come to Marengo for high school. Okay, I interesting. A, I, I have a couple of questions. By all means. What, uh, what happened to the German POWs? And mm -hmm. then how did the Curtis Candy Company get involved with potato farming? Right, right. So uh, what happened to the German POWs? So they, um, there's this whole process at the end of the war. So 1945 to 1946, um, the U.S. slowly started sending German prisoners of war back to Europe. Um, they, they didn't want to keep them in the U.S. indefinitely. Um, while they were in the United States, uh, between 43 and 45, there was a large uh, re-education program uh, that was going on. Uh, so many would, would you know, sit in, they're, they're basically kind of 
propaganda, anti-propaganda training sessions. So they, they'd sit in a classroom and they'd watch some films. They, they'd see uh, sort of the American side of things. They'd see the concentration camps, things of that nature, um, and, and try to, you know, convey to these war prisoners, hey, the Nazis were not so good, right? Um, and then on the other hand, uh, they were also trying to give them vocational training. They'd, they'd give them some art classes and stuff. Uh, so then in 1945 to 46, the U.S. sent a large portion of these POWs to England, uh, where they actually were tasked with rebuilding uh, a lot of the sort of damage uh, in, in London and elsewhere uh, from the war, uh, and then to other places in, in France and so on. Um, by 46, 47, 48, most of them were back uh, to Germany, uh, is my understanding. Uh, but it was, actually, it was actually a fairly slow process. Um, and then did, did you have another part of your question? I'm sorry. It was about the Curtis Candy Company and how they got involved with uh, potato farming. Right. Okay. So um, my understanding is that during the war, uh, so currently right now with uh, this whole COVID thing, you're seeing a big call from the federal government to, you know, Ford needs to make ventilators and all this stuff. So during the uh, World War II, um, you saw this organization called the War Food Administration um, that was calling on major uh, food companies like Curtis that were generally engaged with things like candy uh, to aid the sort of general war effort for food. Um, so I believe that was, they were on a contract um, to produce potatoes uh, for general foodstuffs in the United States. Uh, and, and that's how they, they came to be involved. Um, and that was pretty common across the United States. Um, like, there's uh, in Tipton County, Indiana, uh, there, was, there were several different tomato canneries that uh, generally speaking were a little bit less staffed, had lower production numbers, um, but they contracted with the federal government for German POWs and they just, their, their numbers just exploded, right? Uh, but it was to keep food going to the American public, to soldiers overseas, and then they were also actually sending food to American allies, so Great Britain and Russia as well. Thank you. Yeah. I have a comment. Absolutely. And actually, Kathy, real quick, how are we doing on time? I, I don't... I'm, I'm fine, because I'm hoping we get to that next part if that's okay still. Okay, yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure everyone else is, is doing okay as well. Um, but yeah, Carl, go, we go ahead. We have 36 people and only one person's dropped out. How's that? Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> right. This is a, a Sunday during the pandemic, right? This is the best Exactly. Right. 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 So anyway, I had a cousin who was a prisoner of war. No way. Uh, it, in, uh, he was German, so he, it was quite natural. Okay. Uh, but, but he was a prisoner of war in England. Okay. I, sure. I knew some people who were prisoners of war in the Soviet Union. Okay. That was for a longer period of time. In fact, 10 years mm -hmm. after the war, they, were, they, they came home. Absolutely. Yeah. And I knew some who were involved in building, helping build the Soviet atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's quite a contrast from, so, from farming. Oh, by far. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we can talk about it. it it's... Okay, it's not on the subject, but I just thought I made a side comment. No, I appreciate it. And, you know, it's interesting to bring it up because on the one hand, you know, all prisoner of war labor, if prisoners of war are working, it, it's fundamentally unfree in some sense, right? Because they're, they're not there of their own volition. They didn't choose to be working on this farm um, or, or in this place, period. But you're, you're correct in bringing that up, that there was a wide variation in treatment of prisoners of war internationally. So in America, hey, you're working on farms. We're not going to have you in, in logging because it's too dangerous. Uh, in Russia, you're correct. It, it, there were much worse conditions. Uh, in fact, you'd probably be deployed to places that they didn't want to send their own people, right? Well, the cases I'm talking about, a guy, his machine was confiscated from Germany, and he was working on his own machine that he had oh. been used in Karl's Ice in Jena. He uh -huh. was using in the suburb of Moscow. I saw oh, wow. the houses that they built and the factories that they built to make optics for their war effort. Yeah. That See, factory the, now made satellite lenses for looking mm -hmm. down at, on Earth to see, you know, what was going on and what we're doing. 
Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the U.S. was trying to abide a bit closer to the Geneva Convention there, uh, which actually specifically prohibited uh, prisoners of war from being used in directly war-related industries, if I remember that wor wording correctly. So if you're working on food, you're not making weapons, right? This, the war is over. Okay. Th these okay. are prisoners after the war. That's sure, right. sure. Yeah, let's stick to the topic. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, everybody, that's my dad. Right. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Does anybody else have more questions related to the Marengo and the Japanese and German experience there? Okay. If not, then um, do you, I, I asked uh, to Sam to talk about the period of time we're living in at this moment from the point of view of a historian. Yes, indeed. You maybe you want to turn off your uh, your. Uh, yeah, we can turn off the share there. All right. Um, yeah. So, so I I'm a I'm a historian of food and landscapes and prison spaces in World War II. So I am not uh, entirely qualified to speak to the issue of of COVID nineteen. But I also do teach. Um, I, I teach at a community college down the street. Well. 45 minutes down the street. But anyways, um, I, I teach there. And uh, a couple weeks back, uh, a few weeks back, uh, in February. The time warped at the moment. I know. Well, end of February, right as COVID was kind of coming on our radars, um, I, I taught them a little bit about the 1918 uh, flu uh, pandemic, um, which was a, a lot of fun and very fascinating. But, um, you know, we've had to move my classes uh, online. Uh, right now, we're doing this whole remote education. We're not doing any of this Zoom meeting stuff because, uh, you know, you can't count for all the students to get on at the same time for, for various reasons. Um, but we did have a long discussion on our last day of class um, about the value of doing history uh, in these sorts of circumstances. Um, because, you know, it, people are dying, people are getting sick, the, we can't go outside of our houses, you know, sort of thing. Um, why, why are we doing this whole, this whole history thing? Uh, and I pose that to my students uh, and ask them, you know, what are the questions we've been asking all semester? And in my American history class, we, we've been asking, you know, what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to belong in America? Um, and, you know, it, by looking at the past, uh, you know, we're really actually trying to gain wisdom, you know, and I asked them what wisdom was, and they're all going through, and, you know, well, it's knowing, it's knowing a lot of stuff, it's having a good judgment of things, you know, I asked them, can, can you be wise while you're young, and a lot of them were like, ah, maybe, I don't know, or, but wisdom, generally speaking, right, it comes from uh, accumulated experience, you got to live through some stuff in order to be wise, and for historians, we're tapping into this vast reserve of past human experience. Um, and so by tapping into that, we can have sort of this uh, different perspective. We can have this ability to judge better uh, in our current circumstances. Um, and that's something that, you know, we do typically as historians and doesn't really go away. Maybe it even gets more important uh, in, times, in times like this. Um, and so, you know, I actually, I'll, I'll share this with you guys because I shared it with my students and I just thought it was great. But um, C.S. Lewis, I, I can't hear you guys, but I can see many of you. But ha have you heard C.S. Lewis or read C.S. Lewis a little bit? Some yes. Nods. Okay. So uh, Chronicles of Narnia guide, but he also uh, was a professor at, at Oxford, right, in Magdalen College at Oxford. And in 1939, uh, as Great Britain was going into war against the Nazis, he gave this lecture called Learning in Wartime to his students at Oxford. Um, and, and I'll just read a portion of it here because it's great. Um, but he says, most of all, perhaps we need intimate knowledge of the past. Not that the past has any magic about it, but because we cannot study the future and yet need something to set against the present to remind us that periods and that much which seems certain to the uneducated is merely temporary fashion. A man who has lived in many places is not likely to be deceived by the local errors of his native village. The scholar who has lived in many times and is therefore in some degree immune 
to the great cataract of nonsense that pours from the press and the microphone of his own age. Do not let your nerves and emotions lead you into thinking your present predicament is more abnormal than, he, than it really is. And he's talking about going out to fight Nazis and he's saying it's not very abnormal. So, I mean, that's great. Um, it puts our, our own circumstance in a little bit of perspective. But then he warns against uh, three things, excitement, frustration, and fear. So excitement that distracts, um, frustration that we just won't have enough time to get our things done, our studies done, and fear that the existential end, our, our deaths, uh, are too close. When in reality, he's saying, you know, there have always been distractions. We've never had control over our time, really. I mean, you know, uh, and, and that our end is never in our hands. Um, and so that should really give us some peace because these challenges that we face now, they, they've always been there, right? But we just see them a little bit more clearly now. And, and that shouldn't deter us from our original task because there's still something good and true and beautiful about life that we're really learning to embody here, um, both at the community college with my students and with Lewis and his students and all of us here, right? We're, we're doing something uh, a little bit removed from our present circumstances, but nonetheless really, really important to it. Uh, and that we're, I feel like we're all, you know, ultimately gonna be all right on that front. So I could talk about the Spanish flu of 1918. I don't really know if that's going to be useful to everyone because we've all learned a lot about it, I'm sure, over the past uh, <laughs> several weeks. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm going to, to bore you there. If anyone has any questions about it, I, I could do my best to answer. But again, I, I study farms in the 40s, not flu in the, in the teens. Um, yeah, how about that? Have we got something to say? If anyone yeah. has any questions? I heard a yes. Oh, that was my mother. Oh, that was, okay. <laughs> Well, if she has any questions, she's welcome to throw them in, too. Yeah, but. I love history. <laughs> oh, delightful. You know, the change. Are you talking about Patton? Yeah. Oh, I'm a he reminder. He and his wife were second cousins. Well, okay, but and he was just... up here at Fort Fair. Oh, this is interesting, Nancy. And, uh... <laughs> Stick to the subject. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, her mom. Anyway, <laughs> the point is that a lot of those girls, they, they loved both, you know, Patton and his wife liked to grow vegetables. They were better on a health group. And so, they, they didn't want any hassle. It is my, we're now at world, that's World War, that's pre-World War One. No, two. No, uh, yeah. no, no, no. Well, uh, anyway, Pat Patton, by the way, did live in Fort Sheridan, uh, 1909 to 1911. Wow. Oh, how great is that? <laughs> yeah. In, in fact, uh, last year was the 150th anniversary of Highland Park's founding. And uh, in fact, that was my presentation for the Midwestern History program. Oh, excellent. It's now canceled. Uh, oh, no. And we did actually a list of Olympians from Highland Park. We forgot three people. Patton, Michael Jordan, and, uh, you know, his one of his, yeah, and Scotty Pippen. The obvious, you know, yeah, I know. We were kicking ourselves. Oh, man. Months what, a, later. What, a, what a list of luminaries you have, right? <laughs> and the problem was that Mrs. But does anyone else have any other questions about, uh, well, disease for the non-disease. I have, I have a question. By um, all means. I was wondering, it goes back to the Spanish flu of 1918. Okay. I was wondering if there's anything we should have learned from the Spanish flu epidemic that we really didn't learn in preparation for the current crisis. Hmm. Anything we should have, should have learned from 1918 that we didn't? You know, the, the one thing I've seen from, from some historians uh, is the, the rate at which places lock down. Now, this is kind of a little bit 
in hindsight for us here as well, because well, most places are locked down to some degree. Um, but uh, one thing that some historians of 1918 were pushing was uh, they saw numbers between, I believe it was, it was Philadelphia, um, gosh, and Detroit, maybe. And the, each of these two cities, they, one of them, uh, when they heard the Spanish flu was coming, they were starting to see their first cases. Uh, and they were going to have their big, um, it was either St. Patrick's Day or Mardi Gras, one of these two celebrations. And uh, in the one city, they canceled everything uh, and they stopped, you know, all the public gatherings. And the other one, they're like, eh, let's have one more big public thing. And their rate of disease spread uh, in that city was, was massively outpaced uh, the others. Um, and so um, I think one thing they were urging uh, early on, historians of, of 1918 were urging, uh, you know, there's much faster shutdowns than, than what we saw. Um, but, you know, that's, that's easy for, for the historians to say, right, we're not in the policy making positions. So, yeah, uh, as far as things to learn, I mean, the other thing uh, that you saw a lot, uh, which I showed my students, I mean, people wore masks constantly during 1918. They were pretty widespread. Um, and, uh, you know, you couldn't get onto uh, buses, right, uh, in New York if you didn't have a mask on. Uh, they'd, they'd just turn you away. So, I mean, maybe that's one thing we can learn from them. Uh, I think there's increasing consensus that masks are a good thing. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that to the, the public health experts, I suppose. Any other questions? Well, I think not, it looks like. Um, but I appreciate your coming today. I appreciate everybody who showed up today. Who well, thank made you all. Who made this whole effort worthwhile because it really is an experiment for us too. You know, I've thought about doing these things in the past, but it was like a thought. But, you know, with the current conditions, you're bored at home. Well, you know, it, it's, it's a nice outlet and to learn something new. Absolutely. And it was this, you know, when I already had the date and the time announced, all I had to do was change location. Right? There you go. And we're all here nonetheless. I think this worked very well. Oh, I think so too. From, from the presenter's standpoint, th this was delightful. So I'm so, I'm just so pleased that all of you are here. I really appreciate your presence and, and your thoughtful comments and questions. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And, and this will be, this was recorded and it will be going up I just have to figure out how much at the beginning I need to slip off, but otherwise it will be present in the future to check out. Thank you again, Sam. Oh, thank you, Kathy, and thank you, everybody. Have a great time. Stay safe, all right? Definitely. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Yeah. For sure, none of us came in contact with each other today. We got that going for us. <laughs> we got that going. <laughs> Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.